Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to my talk today. Sorry about the delay. Had a bit of hardware issues. Um, my name is uh, Boris Kolpakov. Uh, I am a founder and a software engineer at Code Synthesis, where we try to solve um, interesting C++ problems using uh, source code generation techniques. Uh, the topic of today's presentation is the new GCC plugin architecture, how it can be used to parse C++ and what new tools and applications we can build on it. Uh, but before we go into uh, detail, who has never heard of GCC? Okay. Who has never used GCC? Use GCC. Before you went over to the dark side. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so every, that's good. Everyone's familiar with GCC. Who has heard of ODB? Yeah, clearly not as popular as GCC. Um, ODB... Never heard of it. I thought you said heard of it. Uh, well, I've heard about object relational mapping. I don't know, is ODB a particular product that that's does object relation? Okay, I know the first... I don't know the, the problem. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, ODB is an, is an object relational mapping system for C++. Uh, it's a project of mine and it's implemented as a GCC plugin. So I'm going to refer to it from time to time in this talk to make uh, examples and problems that we are trying to solve more realistic and more concrete. Um, I'm also giving another talk on Thursday which will introduce ODB and um, show how it can be used with a uh, boost. So you might want to attend this talk uh, if you are interested in uh, object relational mapping or if you want to see what kind of things can be done with the GCC plugin. Okay, so let's then dive into the, uh, the new GCC plugin architecture. Um, it uses dynamic loading and allows us uh, to hook into the compilation pipeline anywhere starting from the compiler startup and ending with a similar output. Uh, the command line on this slide shows uh, how we, we can load a plugin and pass some command line options to it. The first version of GCC which had plugin support uh, is, is 4.5 which was released in April 2010. Uh, current mainline releases with uh, plugin support are 4.5.3 and 4.6. So there are actually two mainline versions now that have plugin support. So while, while the architecture is, is fairly new, it's also been around for about a year now. GCC can easily be the most widely used C++ compiler. Uh, it's available on all Unix-like uh, operating systems. On Windows, it's part of the MinGW and Sigwin tool chains. It's also a cross-compiler of choice for numerous mobile and embedded systems. Plugin require, plugins in GCC require support for dynamic loading. So this kind of narrows a little bit uh, the platforms on, on which uh, we can, do, we can use plugins. For most uh, Unix, Unix like systems, uh, this works out of the box. Uh, on Windows, we can uh, link uh, a plugin statically into the GCC executable with a, with a bit of effort. As an example, um, ODB, ODB works on Linux, Windows, macOS, and Solaris. So, as you can see, we can create a fairly portable. Uh, plugin-based applications and tools. The plugin interface itself is, is, def is defined as a C API, um, but the plugin, uh, the plugin implementation can be in C, in C++, or even C++ or X. Um, the plugin source code is normally compiled with GCC. Let's now look uh, at the GCC compilation pipeline. The first thing that uh, that happens is the parsing of the 
input file to the abstract syntax tree or uh, in GCC speak uh, just tree. Then the tree is, is progressively transformed to lower and lower level representations. Uh, in, this, in, this, in, the CC, in GCC terminology, this uh, transformation is called lowering of the tree. Uh, the tree is actually modified as it is being lowered. A plugin can register uh, to perform some actions pretty much anywhere in the, in the compilation pipeline. Uh, the available uh, callback points are defined in the plugin event enumeration, which is part of the, of the plugin API. For example, the start unit uh, event <coughs> occurs before GCC starts parsing the input file. Uh, finish type event is triggered when GCC finished, uh, finished parsing every uh, user-defined type, such as class or star. The pre generate size um, uh, callback is called uh, for each function before its, its um, tree representation is lowered to, to the generic form. So because, because we can plug um, a, a plugin can uh, hook into the into many levels in the compilation pipeline. There's quite a lot of things that we can do uh, using GCC plugins. We can do source code generation. Uh, we can do some source code analysis. We can uh, perform additional optimizations, and then finally we can instrument source code or object code. Now, if we want to make our tools uh, applicable to projects that use C++ compilers other than GCC, then we can't really perform uh, additional optimizations or object code instrumentation because th those things would be GCC specific. So this is draw out for the purpose of this talk. Uh, source code analysis and instrumentation are interesting uh, areas, but in this talk I'll primarily focus on uh, parsing C++ for the purpose of generating some source code from it. So the other two items are out as well. Um, however, uh, towards the end of the talk, we'll revisit this uh, issue and we'll con consider what other applications we can build, including those areas that I'm not going to cover in the main part of the talk. Um, licensing is a sensitive issue, so let's address it uh, <laughs> now. I hope most of you won't leave after this slide. <laughs> um, well, GCC itself is licensed under the GPL. I think there's no surprise here. Um, a plugin must be licensed under the GPL or a more liberal GPL compatible license. For example, we can license under the Boost license, BSD or Apache because they're all GPL compatible. Uh, finally, the generated source code um, can have any license that, that you decide to use. So, if if you want to write a plugin for commercial use, and you're just going to use it internally. Do you have to pretty, make that pretty much open source is because GCC itself is is, is uh, GPL? If you use it, yes. Yeah, the the plugin will uh, if you if you release the plugin. Basically, you cannot release the plugin uh, in a binary one. Right. So if I just did a project and I used it to generate code and didn't release it to anybody, I wouldn't have to release that. No. no. Okay. Internal use. So essentially, the only thing you cannot do for the plugin is release it under a proprietary license. You don't have to release it under the GPL. You can release it under a more liberal license. Any other questions about licenses? So we want to parse some C++ and generate some source code from it. Uh, the representation that we want to use for, for this is the abstract syntax tree because any, anything lower than that starts losing information. Uh, so look, let's look at the uh, GCC AST or just GCC3 for short uh, in more detail. The, the root of the tree is the global namespace global variable. 
uh, GCC uses quite a lot of global variables to represent different parts of the of the tree. The tree itself is a is a curious uh, data structure. It's uh, it's an implementation of the uh, polymorphic data type idea in C. The the base uh, handle for all the tree nodes is the tree pointer type. Um, because because the actual nodes can be of some extended type, access to the data stored in such nodes is done via macros. So when you are working with uh, GCC tree, you pretty much just use macros. There, there, are no, there are hardly any function calls. Each tree node in the in the AST has uh, a, an integer type ID, which identifies what kind of node it is. Uh, this in these type IDs are called tree codes, and we can get a tree code for any tree node using the tree code macro. So this is the first example of the macro that uh, we we use with a GCC tree. Um, the each each tree uh, node type um, has a, a corresponding tree code constant defined for it. We'll see some examples of that in, in just a moment. Uh, there are two uh, major um, categories of tree nodes in GCC AST. Uh, declaration nodes such as type declaration or variable declaration and type nodes such as record type or array type. Um, in GCC AST, the record refers to a struct or, or a class type. The type vehicle, var vehicle, record type and array type names that I mentioned on these slides are the tree code constants that I mentioned earlier. Tree nodes can also form linked lists uh, and we can use the tree chain macro to traverse such lists. Uh, here's a code example that shows how this is done. This is a fairly common uh, piece of code when working with GCC AST. A declaration node names an entity in a scope. Um, we, can we can get the name of, of a declaration using the decal name macro. Uh, here's an example how we can get a declaration's name as a C string. Well, as you can see, there's actually quite a bit more code than you know, one would expect. Other macros that are useful when dealing with declarations are tree type, uh, decal source file, and decal source line. The tree type macro returns the declaration's type. For example, if we have a, a variable declaration, then this macro will return uh, this variable's type. Uh, the decal source file and decal source line macros return the file and line information for a declaration. Uh, remember the, the global namespace uh, variable that I mentioned earlier. This variable points to a, uh, to a namespace declaration node corresponding to the root of the of the uh, corresponding to the global namespace. Um, a namespace declaration has two lists. Uh, the first list contains all the declarations except uh, namespaces, while the second list contains all the nested namespaces. Let's now create a simple uh, traverser of GCC tree that prints some information for each declaration. The root of our traverser will be uh, the traverse namespace function which we call uh, with a global namespace to start the process. Let's now look at the implementation of the traverse namespace function. The first thing that we do um, is traverse the declarations in this namespace. For that we call the, the traverse declarations function which we'll examine in the next slide. Uh, next thing we do, we traverse all the nested namespaces. Uh, you might be wondering what, what this is about. Uh, besides declarations that come from the file being compiled, uh, GCC tree can <coughs> contain implicit declarations for uh, RTTI exceptions, uh, compiler built-ins, similar things. The built-in test that is highlighted in the slide, uh, make sure that we don't see those 
if if we would remove that, then we would see hundreds of implicit declarations that are inserted by the compiler. Uh, because namespace is a declaration, we we call the print declaration function to print some information about. It. Finally, we call the traverse namespace function to recursively traverse all the nested namespaces. Okay, let's now look at the traverse declarations function. It's very really similar to traverse namespace. Here we essentially uh, traverse all the, iterate over the chain of, of, of nested declarations and print each of them. The final piece in our traverse is the print declaration function. First line, in the first line we get the tree code for the declaration. The next four lines get the declaration's name. This is <coughs> the same piece of code <coughs> that we've seen earlier. On the next line we use the tree code <coughs> name uh, variable, which is an array of human readable strings uh, for each tree code. This, this variable is, is very useful um, during debugging when you get nodes that you don't know what kind of, of type they are. So you can print and see what you are getting. Okay, so, and that's, that's pretty much it. Uh, let's now see uh, what we get if we run this traverse on, on some sample C++. Here I have a, a function declaration, a class in the namespace, a type diff and a global variable. And here's the output of our, of our traversal. Let's look at this output uh, again. Is anything catching your, your attention? It's not in order of the line numbers. Right. Exactly. But when I started working with GCC plugins, I expected that I'll be traver iterating over declarations in the order in which they were declared in the source code. Uh, as, as we can see clearly from this output, this is not the case. Uh, while having two lists of, of declarations in the namespace node would already not allow such ordered iteration, um, order of declarations in the same list is, is often not, not preserved either. Plus, um, GCC uh, merges all the declaration nodes corresponding to the same namespace uh, into a single tree node. So essentially what GCC does, it, it kind of gets rid of all the lexical information in the program, which is not really necessary um, when we compile C++ to object code. But the good news is that uh, we can restore all this information with a line and column and column in front. Uh, well, we, we can restore the order of declarations using the line and column information. Let's now look at the type nodes. Uh, their three codes end with a type suffix. And remember, we can get uh, a type node corresponding to a declaration using the tree type and macro. There are, three there are three categories of type, type nodes in GCC uh, AST. The first is uh, the fundamental types, such as Boolean integer. Then we have derived types. And the term derived here refers to reference point and array types rather than C++ class inheritance. Finally, we have user-defined types, such as record, uh, which is struct or class type union types and, and enumerations. Each type node in GCC contains a, a const volatile restrict qualifier or just CVR qualifier for short. When we make, uh, when we qualify a type with a, for example, a const a qualifier, GCC makes a copy of the original type in order to create a const qualified version. In fact, GCC can have multiple copies, multiple tree nodes that refer to exactly the same type. For example, GCC creates um, a copy of a node for each type div declaration. Uh, we can use the type main variant 
uh, macro to get the primary CVR unqualified node for any type node in the tree. So this is actually a, a very, very useful uh, macro as we will see in a moment. Another curious aspect of the GCC abstract syntax tree is that um, type nodes are not named. Uh, they don't have names. Instead, they are declared to have names with a type, uh, type declaration. But this poses a problem for C++ classes which do have names. So to fit this into the GCC model, um, uh, class class types uh, are, are represented as if they were declared with a type div. So when we write something like class C, then in in the AST it's represented as if we wrote type div class class and assign it the name C. But then this poses another problem. Um, consider these two lines of code. How do we distinguish between the actual class type and its type diff alias? Um, to distinguish between these two cases, uh, GCC marks uh, nodes that are imagined by the compiler, type, type declarations that are imagined by the compiler as artificial. Uh, we can test that using the Deco artificial macro. So we, we know how to get from a declaration to its type, but how do we get from a type to its uh, type declaration? This can be useful, for example, if we want to, to obtain a type's name. For this, we can use the type name macro, which returns the type declaration corresponding uh, to the type, to the type node. Um, note that this returns some uh, type declaration, not necessarily the artificial one. If you want to get the artificial one, then we will need to call uh, this macro on the primary type. This example will show, will help to illustrate the difference. It can be a little bit confusing at the beginning. So here we have uh, a few type diffs and, and, uh, and uh, variable declaration. But given the, given an, uh, assuming that we have uh, a var declaration node corresponding to the i variable, we can get its type using the tree type macro. Now, if we call the type name on this uh, type node, then we will get the type declaration corresponding to the my int alias. However, if we call the same macro using the primary type, then we get a type declaration corresponding to the original long long built-in name. Any questions about this? Can't that be uh, multiple levels? Yep. There are levels. Type def to a type Because def. you can have a type def to a type def. Yeah. Okay. But you see, you can have a, a pretty deep chain of type diffs, but the type main vari variant macro will always return, you know. The, oh, it always go back? Oh. The root of that. What about uh, the information about the class uh, itself? The type B in 4 macro returns the base class vector. Uh, the type fields macro returns all the um, member variable declarations and nested types. Finally, the type methods macro return all the uh, member functions. I'm not going to show how to access all this information. It's very similar to what we, already, we have already seen. Um, instead, I'm going to show a sample C++ class which is shown on this slide. And I also show uh, the output of a simple plugin which prints all this information. I also mention uh, towards the end of the talk where you can get the source code for this plugin. Yes, just a quick question orientation. Got, got source source code. Uh -huh. 
and I've got a plugin which is its own main. I'm trying to envision what this plugin is. It's a plugin for GCC itself. Yeah. Oh, so, 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 so it becomes part of the GCC. Yeah. So you, oh, I see. So you. So it's a shared library, which oh, okay. is loaded by GCC. Okay, I got it. I understand. Okay, and all those macros are, are documented within the GCC. That's right. Okay. So, before you do the example, can you go back a slide? Sure. Um, <coughs> so, I've got a class, kind of like your following example here. Mm -hmm. You know, when I get type fields and type methods, um, if I'm inheriting and so forth, is what I get back related to the specific scoped part of the type that I'm looking at now? Or does it include the base classes and all the rest? Or, or you know, if I needed to get the entire unrolled set of fields, say, in, in, in a class that inherits other fields, would I have to unroll those classes? Yes, you will have to. Okay. It, it, it doesn't duplicate the base class. But I think there are, I believe there are functions uh, within GCC that kind of, you know, can, you can look up a so name some, somehow in, in out of the, the class. Somehow out of the B info, you can get the base classes yes. and then you can... Okay. And then you can get the fields from the base class, then you can get the base class of that base class. Mm -hmm. but, I, but, but the other thing that can be useful, um, and I believe it's possible without, you know, doing it yourself, is that you can look up a name within a class and it will actually, you know, search base classes and do the name conflicts and using declarations takes it, take all this into account. So basically whatever GCC needs to do during parsing, um, you know, you can kind of reuse this function and it's just normally defined as a, as a function which you can call. Right. Mm. The hard part is just sorting through those probably several hundred macros there are to do all this, right? <laughs> So again, here we have a <coughs> kind of capture all the main uh, features of a C++ class. We have some inheritance, we have a member static uh, variable function, constructor, destructor, a type DF declaration, and, and a nested class. And here's the output of our plugin. As you can see, we get a, a pretty accurate <coughs> print out of the, of the class. So mm. how big was the plugin that did this? I would say probably maybe two or three pages of code. <laughs> yeah, the, I'll, I'll mention where you can get the source code. Can Valgrind be re-implemented this way? Or? Uh, I don't think so. It's, it's more of a runtime oh. instrumentation of, of calls. Not that part, not the runtime part. Oh, okay. Well, the whole point of Valgrind is to uh, emulate the hardware. Isn't there a part of it that will, will actually look for like the number of times certain... Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's runtime. Yeah. Sorry. But I, I think I like that you are kind of thinking how we can, what, what kind of things we can do with this. And I'm going to have a whole session mm -hmm. on that and towards the end of the talk where we can explore what we can do with these things. Um, another, bit, another bit of information that um, can be useful when generating some um, code from, from C++ is the pre-process information. For example, you may want to know from which um, included here the file a particular declaration comes and how this here the file was included into the main input file. Um, again, I'm not going to show out the access that uh, I have a plugin sample that does that. Um, but I'll just show and, and tell you that the whole uh, a fairly complete pre-processing information is available. So assuming that we have this include directive in the main input, input file, we, we can recreate a pretty uh, accurate include tree. Uh, here's an example output uh, on 
on my GCC based uh, machine. So that one, that one you can get out with just an option on GCC, right? I think there's an option that already gives you Right, this. yeah. yeah. GCC has an option to print all the infinite um, group directors, but this is something that you can get at runtime within a plugin. And you see, this, this, this example shows how we can um, print all the include that. Um, include three starting from the main file, but what you can also do, given that, for example, you have a declaration node, then you can find its location, and then you kind of unroll it all the way to the main input file, and you have, and you see how, you know, through which files it was included. So, in ODB, we find that quite useful um, in order to include necessary files in the generated code. Okay, okay that, that's pretty much a high level overview of the GCC abstract syntax tree. Let me just mention a few major areas that I haven't talked about. Uh, these are function declarations, uh, function bodies and templates. As you can probably imagine, the templates area is not really for the faint of heart. <laughs> it's fairly complex stuff. Um, let me also summarize the key point of point, key points about the GCC abstract syntax tree. Uh, while the interface is not uh, the most elegant one, and some things are, can be quite inconvenient, uh, the good thing is that you can usually get the information that you need. How many of you are, are familiar with OpenMP and its pragma-based language? Okay, so a few people. Um, the basic idea is that sometimes we want to annotate our C++ code with some extra information. Is a hypothetical example. Traditionally, ad hoc preprocesses um, use special comments to capture this information. But with plugins we can do better. Uh, a plugin can um, handle, can register and handle custom pragmas and custom attributes. This allows us to create a, a domain specific language that's, that is embedded directly into C++, uh, very similar to what is possible with uh, very similar to the language used by OpenMP. <coughs> um, a plugin can can register custom pragmas during the pragma registration event. It's uh, basically one of the entry in that uh, plugin events enumeration that I mentioned earlier. Uh, a pragma handler is given a chance to parse the tail of the pragma. Basically, GCC parses the name of the pragma, and then the hand calls the handler, and the handler can continue parsing the this after the name. So the format of the pragma is completely up to plugin developer. The handler can also, uh, also has, a, has, has full access to the uh, abstract syntax tree that has been built so far. So some things that we can do is, for example, look up some names that are used in the prime and see you know, whether it's a type or a member and whether it's something that we are expecting to get. Uh, we use pragmas heavily in, in ODB. Similar to pragmas, uh, a plugin can register a custom attribute to, during the attribute registration event. Uh, 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 an attribute handler doesn't really need to do much um, because by default they are automatically added to the tree, to the corresponding tree node. We can use the vehicle attributes and type attributes macros to obtain the list of custom uh, attributes for a declaration and a type node respectively. So this, this um, is pretty much the 
high level overview of, of, of main features of GCC plugins. We've seen um, uh, you know how we can use AST, how we can query AST for information and we also covered custom pragmas and, and plugins which I think is, is fairly important feature. Um, now I would like to show a couple of more advanced techniques that we use in ODB. Uh, the first one is a runtime template instantiation uh, and here's the problem that uh, we encountered and that we addressed using this technique. Uh, while simple types like int or string uh, are stored in, in rows, um, containers such as vector, they occupy a table of their own. So in ODP somehow we need to distinguish between um, container and non-container types. Well, one way to do that would be to just hard code the names of the non-containers into the plugin, right? Well, but this approach doesn't scale very well, especially if we, if we want to support custom containers. But this actually gets worse. Uh, be besides knowing just whether a type is a container or not, in case it is a container, we also need to know a kind of container. This is necessary in order, in order to create the correct tables for the container. For example, for ordered containers, we create uh, uh, one kind of table, for uh, set containers, another, and for map containers, yet another. <coughs> so, how would we handle this, uh, this problem if we were writing an ordinary C library? Any, any suggestions? File time. Traits, exactly. <coughs> you would use traits, uh, maybe something along these lines. That makes sense to everyone, right? I think it's a fairly idiomatic way to handle this, this situation. It turns out that uh, we can use exactly the same technique in, in a plugin. A plugin can instantiate a template at runtime. Uh, it, it can basically create in an instantiation in the AST that that weren't really that didn't really exist in the program that is being compiled. Uh, and once a plugin instantiates a template, it can examine the resulting instantiation and extract some data from it. Here's a, um, here's a code fragment that shows how we can do that. I think the fact that you know it's, it's fairly complete and the fact that it, it, it fits into one slide is, is, quite, is quite an achievement. So given a type that we want to test, the first thing that we do is look up the, the container traits um, template. Next, we create uh, the template argument vector and instantiate the template. These functions that we, we call are all provided by GCC. This is basically what GCC uses itself. And we're just reusing the functionality. So if, if this succeeded, then we know that this type is a container, and then we can go ahead and ex extract its kind. <laughs> Otherwise, this type is not a container. Any questions about this? So the, the traits approach is, is nice and elegant, but how do we uh, include the necessary definitions of traits into the translation unit? Well, one way would be to ask the user to incl include the necessary headers explicitly. Well, this is not really very elegant, right? Uh, passing all the uh, traits files to the, GCC uh, to the GCC compiler won't work either. In this case, GCC will simply compile each file 
individually instead of all of them at once. So what we need is a way to add some extra code before or after uh, the file being compiled while maintaining the original file and line information so that, that we get the correct di diagnostics. Well, this is a bit tricky, but, but possible. As, you, as some of you may know, GCC can parse the standard input file. So what we are going to do is pipe a, a synthesized translation unit to GCC using the line preprocessor directives to maintain the original uh, file and line information. A plugin can then set the main uh, input file directory so that the quote includes will work uh, correctly. Here's an example of a, of a synthesized translation unit. The code between the last two line directives is actually what comes from the, from the input file. I think that's pretty much a high-level overview of, of you know, what's possible at GCC and a few adv more advanced techniques that we discovered while working on ODB that we, well, I thought they were quite cool. Um, let's now compare GCC plugins to another C++ compiler which uh, allows us to reuse its parser. Um, well, the, the compiler is C-Lang, and uh, I know that's not the correct pronunciation, but it kinda, I'm kind of got used to it, and so I'm going to use that. Um, also, let me warn you right away that um, this, com this comparison is very subjective. I spent uh, quite a bit of time working with GCC, but only played, a only played with C-Lang probably for a couple of days. Uh, mainly in preparation for this talk. Mm, so, uh, if if you find something that that you believe is not correct, uh, so please don't get offended and rather you know, point it out and you know, we can discuss it. So here here are my impressions. Uh, while the GCC documentation is is not great, C Lang's documentation is an examples are virtually non-existent. Here I'm talking about a high-level overview of the AST and the overall compiler architecture. In fact, the, the best source of information that I found for CLang is, is the mailing list archives. Um, the CLang AST is written in C++, but uh, it borrows quite a few concepts from GCC. Also, CLang's AST is essentially immutable. Um, quoting main, mailing list here again. Mm -hmm. um, this is in contrast to GCC, which allows us to create extra functions, extra variables, static initializers, instantiate templates at runtime, as we have seen. Um, CLang also doesn't have support for custom pragmas or attributes. Uh, if you want to implement those, you'll have to hack the CLang scope directly. On the other hand, CLang, well, I think everyone knows by now that CLang has much better diagnostic than GCC. Um, it also preserves more uh, lexical information in, in its abstract syntax tree. There's also explicit support for source code rewriting. So that, those are quite nice features that GCC doesn't have. Uh, CLang also has a plugin interface which is completely undocumented. You cannot even find an option, that, that the description of an option uh, to load the plugin. And again, quoting mailing list here, uh, the plugin interface is not very robust and should probably not be used. This, this leaves us with two options if we want to create our own tools based on CLang. We can either create our own compiler driver, uh, which requires kind of a large amount of boilerplate code 
or we can hack the CLang code, source code directly. Basically, take the CLang source code and modify it for our needs. Uh, Excuse me, they don't use the word hack there, they intend it. That's how they intended people to. Well, I, I don't use the word hack here in, in, in a bad sense. You oh. know, that we basically take the code and then you tear it apart to right, change right. it. Um, the, the, the last method actually appears to be you know, the preferred, mm -hmm. if not a recommended way of doing things. But that, that's problematic, right? I mean, because if you're, gonna, if you're going to build whatever tool you're going to build and CLang is changing out from underneath you at, over time, right? Whatever updates and fixes and whatever they put in, you're going to have to by hand merge that into your fork of the source, basically. Yeah. So I agree. You know, I think I think it's, it's kind of it's nice. yeah. I mean, so nice I think the bottom line is, I wouldn't think anybody that's involved in in that would would claim. I I hope they wouldn't claim. I don't know that that that's the right way to have a plugin architecture. I'm guessing it's because of that first line that the plugin interface is not very robust. Yeah, right. and, and <laughs> you know those guys are busy trying to get it to compile. You know, stuff, I, I think right? of the the, the C lang approach as being, you know, we have a we have a library here. If you want to build a tool using this library, build a tool using the library. Don't take the compiler and try to make it into something else because the compiler is just another tool that uses mm -hmm. these set of libraries. My impression is completely opposite. Okay. The, 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 uh, in, well, maybe I'm not correct, but my impression is that the library and the compiler is the same thing. No, no the no. driver is actually in the library. No, it's actually, the driver is a library which then, then is there's a front end which just is the main, which calls the driver library and runs it. Mm -hmm. So you can use the driver library to derive from it and build your own tool. And, but it's all not quite settled because it's not much is really stable and they say so. They have a, for, for the things you, you, do, you are doing here, they have a C interface which is quite stable, which is not um, full, which there are missing declarations and something which you can use. But the C++ stuff, the, the AST is not stable, and they say so because it's just too early in development mm -hmm. to to settle on. Well, we are going to stay with this AST forever. And the same is with the plugin interface; they just don't need it yet. And as long as nobody comes along <coughs> to to implement it and make it stable, it won't happen. That's what I understand, and I'm not feeling like these are Well. Uh, that's that's kind of also my understanding. <coughs> that, uh, <coughs> well, from the mailing list, my impression was that the recommended way is to just go and modify the C -Lang yes. library to to suit your needs. In fact, there was a course last year at Boost on how to do that. Uh, I'm actually going to refer to that. That's the yeah. part. <laughs> just <Okay>. so, <coughs> stabil speaking of stability, how does GCC how do GCC plugins handle AST changes? Speak of the because presumably the GCC developers occasionally change the AST. Um, the well, I mean, if, if if the AST changes, then it's not really um, <laughs> you know it changes. You need to adapt to that. But the GCC plugin pl provides a, a, a runtime versioning support, so you can, you know, you can detect the version of GCC with which you are compiled and with which you are into which you are loaded, at, like as a plugin writer. You can also you can also um, specify, you know, that your plugin will only work with this version of GCC, which is kind of automatic. Okay, but there's no real commitment on the part of the GCC developers to keep any of those interfaces stable. No. no. It's open source. <laughs> Sebastian just. <coughs> He's a yeah. Clang developer. Okay. A bit late. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Two slides again. <laughs> so just as a, just a, for my own information, uh, does GCC support Microsoft debug formats? I don't think. I don't think anyone. Anybody. Well, it's a published. Uh, it's, uh, it's a published for. It's a published documented format. I mean, 
clearly you could actually write a plug-in for GCC that would actually spit oh, out all the debugging information that would allow you to use the debugger. I'm, I'm pretty sure you can do that. So, but I can't use GCC for Windows unless I can debug it with Visual Studio. Well, there's one project, one interesting project. Yeah, there you go. So I guess you need to go to his other talk, get a little more information so you can go write the plugin. There you go. I think it's a pretty serious job also. I don't think Microsoft particularly cares about compatibility between different versions. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of like you can't be to it here, that's you, you will have to kind of keep keeping up with Microsoft. It's just there C plus plus and we hide that keeps changing. I can't debug it. So I don't know, maybe I should should I just kind of rerun the last couple of slides for you? Because nah, you don't push it. Okay. Um, okay, so I I mentioned that this is a sub subjective comparison. Well, this last slide is, is like very subjective, so <laughs> be warned. This is just my impression and my kind of feelings about things. So CLang is, is BSD, uh, is licensed under the BSD and is developed primarily by, by a single company. Define primarily. I mean, there's think on the Clang front and there's Eight developers employed by Apple. I think two or one or two from Intel. I know there's one from AMD. I know there's guys from Google working on it. So all in all, I think it's maybe half of the people working on it are Apple. Okay, so maybe you know that's kind of the impression I got every time someone asks a question on the mailing list, you know, mm -hmm. conceptual kind, and then someone from Apple will come and, and, and answer. So I guess let, let me let me then <laughs> ask uh, this question. Let's say, you know, Apple, you know, all those developers stop contributing to CLang. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the project will continue? Will the people who are working for other companies and you know universities will they, for example, be able to continue uh, adding C++ or X features? They will definitely be able. Whether they're still willing, if if if. If Clang loses that much momentum, is a different question. Okay. Well, I, uh, somebody asked me actually this question just like a week and a half ago. So what I did was I uh, I grabbed all the messages to the LLVM commit list for the last six months, mm -hmm. and there have been you know, like 108 distinct email addresses who committed stuff to LLVM, of which 34 had Apple emails. An unscientific test and. And you know, some people it could be some people are contributing from home email addresses mm -hmm. while they work at Apple. But I actually also studied the kind of messages just mm -hmm. out of curiosity. What I noticed uh, just just a second, I'll, I'll come back to you. Um, what I noticed is that um, a lot of people that are not uh, working for Apple then they contribute in kind of. Um, you know, st additional warning implementation or additional static analysis test because all this stuff is kind. You know, any any code that kind of gets reused by the community, it's, it's just put back into CLang library. Mm -hmm. So that that was kind of my impression. But yeah, as as I said, I can be wrong. With that. But you know, this 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 arrangement makes me a little bit uncomfortable if I, if I if I kind of come into to see. So I was going to just suggest that uh, <clears throat> there's more than enough room in the world for both GCC and Clang, CLang, whatever we want to call it. And uh, I think having two open source compilers is actually a good thing. Um, and that we shouldn't <coughs> worry about it and we should go on to talk about some of the other good things. Um, no, I, I, agree tell, so. I agree completely. Um, just one perspective on it. Right. Uh, but at, at the same time, you know, people who, who want to, you know, implement the tool and they're trying to decide between the two. So I think this, 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 this discussion can, can be useful. But yeah, let me just go over the last uh, couple of things. 
then the, the other, the other uh, problematic from my point of view part is, is support for platforms other than uh, Mac OS and Linux. Uh, I found that they, they're quite patchy, especially when you move to things like Solaris. I haven't really seen much mention about that. Mm -hmm. Then there is also uh, delayed distribution packaging. Um, for example, uh, CLang 2.9 was released almost a month and a half ago, but the last time I checked there was still no Ubuntu package for it. Um, another thing is that there is no CLang diff package. Uh, those of you who work on the thread based operating systems and uh, Debian based um, probably know what it is. It's basically a package that contains headers and libraries. So you don't have to build the CLang from source yourself. Well, while, while building it from source yourself is probably not a problem, uh, but it can be an issue for the users of, of your tools, you know, if you're distributing them as open source. Uh, the nice thing about GCC plugins is that in, 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 in this case, you can you basically install GCC and then you install the GCC plugin package, which con uh, contains headers for the for the plugin API. Then you know you install the tool, build it with GCC, and then it's ready to go. You don't actually need to build GCC. <coughs> Finally, um, to me, CLang doesn't feel like a production audit compiler. Um, there's there's quite a bit of of, of funny code. Yeah, my opinion. <laughs> uh, this is quite a bit about funny code. Funny code. <laughs> I'm gonna show you. I have worked on GCC too. You know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, this is what I was afraid. Of. <laughs> but ju just for laughs, let me uh, uh, show a couple of examples. <laughs> um, well, Doug Greger gave a talk about CLang at last year's BoostCon, right? Mm -hmm. And he created uh, a little example, um, which in CLang spirit was just hacked directly into the compiler library itself. Well, the funny thing is that it's still there. And it's great. It's a great starting point for many people. Every time someone comes to the mailing list and says, hey, I want to enumerate all functions and whatever, we say then, hey, look at this. This is how you do it. So we just left it in as an example. But, uh, well, kind of, the, the bit strange thing for me is that this code is actually in the in the production compiler binder. It's not like a separate example, it's right in the compiler. So if you have CLang installed, you can invoke it with this command line. <laughs> so I can I can go to, to you know, my Debian box, install the package for CLang and run this command line and I'll get a boost example. <laughs> <laughs> then, um, the other thing is I like is this quote from, <laughs> from the documentation. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I agree completely with you. I think that having two uh, open source uh, C++ compilers that allow you to Reuse their parsers is a, is a is a really great thing for for the C++ community. In here we have an alternative implementation as well as an alternative license. I, and I also think that having some uh, healthy competition is is a good thing. Um, so we now have a, a pretty uh, good high level overview of, of of the things that we can do with. Uh, with GCC plugins, and we can probably do most of that things with CLang as well. Uh, let's now. Uh, I would like now to have a, a quick uh, brainstorming, you know, session slash competition uh, about what kind of tools and applications we can build with this. Um, well, for the competition part, I, would, I like crazy ideas because they can lead to some interesting. Insights. Mm -hmm. So, in, in, in terms of competition, the craziest idea wins. So, yeah, give me your bad idea, <coughs> insane ideas. Um, let's start with code generation. Any, any? Huh? Sure. Um, <clears throat> you could easily create a plugin that spit out header files 
that contained um, information that allowed you to invent introspection for debugging. So for, um, you know, give me all the methods, uh, give me the names of the <coughs> methods, the functions, the function arguments. Not only for debugging, useful for runtime yeah. modules or stuff right. like that. Right. Mm -hmm. Or fusion, you can do auto fusion nice your structure. For example, if you yeah. have a struct and want to make a fusion stack of it out of it, you have basically to re-enumerate your your member fun your member variables or functions. And well, it would be cool is to be able to have a piece of code, right? Which, which I could say if if this function exists in this class, then call it. You can't do that at runtime in C plus plus. Yeah. So basically, I like a new version of Spirit Key or that. Uh, actually can use the real uh, peg grammar syntax instead of having to use operator overloading in some approximation. Yeah, that's a good idea. What if you stood out coding a completely different language? <laughs> <laughs> right, Pat, with Python wrappers to handle so you can call C++ libraries to Python. Right. So, so your so equivalents of things like Swig, right? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Integrate yeah. Yeah. Swig. Yeah. Actually, actually, a swig output would be very well. Yeah, so we can yeah. just get rid of doxygen altogether yeah. and, and go straight to to boost doc. Straight to boost doc. There actually is a project which does something like that. It's from Stefan Seefeld, um, who does it on Clang, who yeah. has called Synopsis. Synopsis. Synopsis uses Clangus. Yeah, uh, he's been working on that for a long, long yeah. time. Yeah. So, but. I mean, I think you, you you can't entirely get rid of Doxygen, if you will, right? I mean, because Doxygen has a, another set of language there, right? So you're, you know, you'd have to implement some additional parsing or something, right? Which would be a little beyond what what we're doing here, right? You're saying to be able to support Java and Python and so on? Well, no, to be able to support the uh, special oh, syntactic the text languages. Of, yeah, exactly, the markup and all that kind of thing. So. You know, you'd, you'd have to get the comments, yeah. which is right. Is it possible in C? Yeah. Yeah, we we did something specifically for synopsis and doxygen like tools that there is a special way that they can get comments. Does GCC throw the comments out? No, it, you cannot get comments. Okay, GCC. so that's an interesting yeah. problem. Just create uh, well, the idea uh, to create an HTTP server. You you sort of give it your. Um, mm -hmm. You have the boilerplate methods in, in, in the server side, and you just sort of stick in your um, what you wanted to do. You know, you have the standard, um, mm. you know, do get, do post, and um, okay. and the like, and then you um, see so you just put in whatever um, you wanted for for the uh, for the request. You know, just standard, um, just a fast way of doing it without using Java or the. I mean, C plus plus has been very mm. underrepresented on the server side on the um, on the website. So here might be a quick way of doing very fast web generation. Just so you basically submit a piece of C++ code and it's uh, And it'll generate, well, it'll generate a, a main, it'll generate the whole, basically a web server, it'll implement the HTTP uh, um, So it's like it's a, it's a web server generator. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, I exactly think you right. can actually right. do it without the plugin. Because a lot of it's it's boilerplate. It's, you can't do it without plugin, but mm -hmm. but at least here you you just put snippets of code for you do get you do post and for <coughs> multi-threading, throw in some boost to handle some multi-threading stuff. But a lot of the boilerplate is just done here. Yeah. But you could go. You could make that even more generic. You could you could think about it in terms of having uh, a syntax which would allow you to to generate. Uh, remote invocation protocols to objects yes. as a gen general concept where you could use a CORBA or you know some other mechanism besides HTTP and you could yeah you know, so that's so right exactly so you, you would have you could have multiple kinds of bindings there that's hey how about some transactional memory markup oh oh yeah. what <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, about okay. a year ago, I saw a presentation by a smaller company in the in Lemon that was uh, working with the thread and multi-thread error detection. Um, their approach was uh, it was a low-level virtual machine, you know, um, 
at the at the assembly code level, but I was thinking, you know, if you put something like this in, you know, had something both the source code and the, you know, at the low level, you know, you could probably do some pretty nice detection of, you know, thread safety, thread multi-thread errors and stuff. Because, and they admitted it up front, even though they they had very good success rates, it was non-deterministic. I mean, you would run things and they would basically detect problems in your code that were, most of the time they'd get it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but they weren't, you know, it was, it was not, not deterministic. So maybe some combination of that might be a, maybe not 100% deterministic, but pretty close. So maybe like instrument C++ yeah. plus code. Or exactly. Something. Yeah. Because you know if you, if you have the source code, you can you you know you could theoretically at least detect all the places in the code where you're going to have a potential mm -hmm. thread safety issue, and then the combination of two of that. I think I saw some guy on the Clang mailing list trying to do that. Yeah. Okay. Really wild uh, use this to create um, in Cocoa in, in 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 the in the Apple world the layout management is is really difficult. I find it quite difficult. And uh, so you sort of have your high level uh, layout manager sort of language and feed it in here and it generates Coco, you know, Objective-C Coco. <laughs> well, you, you could create, a, a, you know, a pragma attribute based language with some, you know, graphical user interface. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yes. That is embedded yes. directly into C++. Yes, yes. Okay, here's uh, my list that I came up with. And you actually pretty much covered most of it. So we can do some documentation of class diagram generation. Um, dynamic introspection, dynamic function calling, extended RTTI, things like that. Then there's the whole area of object persistence to XML, databases, JSON, whatever have you. Remote invocation, you can probably do it, you know, fairly transparently. Uh, bindings to other languages. Sweet. Sweet has a ad hoc preprocessor which cannot handle a lot of things, so this could be um, something useful. Then transactional objects, a uh, very kind of vague idea, but you know, to, um, to generate some code which would allow us to, to access objects in a transactional way uh, as a way to deal with concurrency complexity. It's probably related to transactional memory. And then this, we can create a whole bunch of uh, domain-specific languages. For example, command line parsing, you create a class and then you write a pragma, this member corresponds to this command line option, this member to this command line option. Run the, uh, a plugin based compiler and generate some parsing code that is your command line parser. Mm -hmm. um, then the same can be probably done with configuration formats and with graphical user interface as well. Okay. Um, then the other area is source code analysis. Uh, the, the ideas of this. Cyclomatic complexity is. is is, is, uh, Some kind of statistical analysis. No, 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 just uh, finding the best path. Mm. Uh, there are different metrics that uh, right. uh, finding dead code methods that are never called. Uh, <coughs> you could probably uh, remove virtual function over, uh, overhead if you happen to know by analysis that there's exactly one derived type that mm. ever exists in this application. And the problem is, is the compiler doesn't actually get an application. It gets a translation unit. Yeah. Uh, but towards the later stages of uh, compilation, we ever see like whole thing together? No, no. link time. The link, the link time. It's got to be whole program optimization. It doesn't matter. You just, you can, you're just going to run it across all your source code anyway, right? I mean, you're not going to run it across one file to do any of those other things that we talked about before either. You have to run it against all the files and build up your own external database or whatever it is. So so that doesn't seem like a big barrier. Yeah, clearly you can build uh, instrumentation wide mm -hmm. to do a simple quantify or purify style mm -hmm. yeah, that, uh, that kind of, of uh, stuff. Convention I mean, enforcement and shaking. That's not a good idea. That's, that's an obvious one. So. <laughs> 
So these days there's a new class of static analysis tools that um, are far superior to the usual lint. Mm -hmm. um, oh yeah. <clears throat> and uh, predominantly because uh, you know the typical lint didn't do much of depth, it didn't really understand anything deep about the language, and so in a large code base you get you know billions of hits. Um, and the modern tools basically work off these ASTs and they can uh, detect patterns and issues and other things uh, by traversing that tree. Now, I don't know that you showed us enough here to implement some of like, you know, what a tool like Coverity can do, but I know. you could do something similar. Yeah, I will, I will tell you one of the, the ones that is... Uh, that we have found to be really, really useful at Qualcomm, where we have a, a large code base of a very old code, which is, in the past has been maintained by some well, not so good developers, and who decided that the best way to to do stuff was copy and paste. Well, um, <laughs> but um, but there's there's a uh, and then change a few things in one. Yeah, and so you have two almost identical blocks of code with the same bug. Two? Well, no, it gets better. There's, there's this. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name. It's a it's a module I think in Fortify that goes through and looks for blocks of code that are almost the same. Yes. yes. And it's, and basically, here's 60 lines of code that refers to, you know, two global variables: global one, global two, global one, global two, global one, global two. And this other block of code that does the same thing only with two different global variables: this global three, global four, global three, global four, global one, global four, and says. Um, did you mean Global 3 here? That's impressive. That's really impressive. Um, and those bugs are darn near impossible to find. Yeah. And when you're looking, you know, you're comparing two blocks of code which are, say, 80 mm -hmm. lines. You could stare at that all day and never see that Global 1 against Global 3. It's like a part, part, almost like a part of recognition. Yes, very much so. Code. But it's, it's part of plagiarism analysis. There's this whole rubric of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, just as another example, I've seen a tool that's able to take um, something where you have a data structure of a fixed size and array, and you know it, it's able to statically analyze the entire call stack and realize that you know seven functions down where you've passed this thing through pointers and whatever that you're accessing outside the array bounds, right, right. without ever running the program. And, and yeah. this is, again, an example of something that's devilishly difficult for, you know, humans to see. Because right. it's so far away, it's basically spooky action in the distance. Clockwork is pretty good about that. Yeah. Okay, so it's, here are some mm -hmm. things that I came up with. Um, mm -hmm. We can create probably a uh, C++ code browser, you know, where you can load uh, code for your complete application and then create cross-references and could probably help in, in comprehension of, of what's going on. Then yeah, checking of names and enforcement of naming conventions in the project, um, reuse analysis uh, and statistical analysis. Yes, that's what Spell checking. Spell checking. Yeah. Spell checking. Yeah. What's it checking? Spell checking. Spell checking. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's Smalltalk 80 had that. <laughs> they run the compiler and it say, you, I don't know any variable called unrused. Did you mean unused? <laughs> like my unmaimed. Or maimed. <laughs> unmaimed. <laughs> unmaimed. <laughs> unmaimed. <laughs> unmaimed. <laughs> you, mean, you mean... You could actually tell when it doesn't find an identifier looking up similar identifier. Yeah. I would climb that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, you know, Clang is 2011 and yeah. Smalltalk 80 was, well, 30 years before. You used to have a program that swore in the code. She would use swear words for variable names. Mm. So you could build a profanity to it. Um, the, the, the other area is source code instrumentation rewriting. Um, I think it's it's a really kind of unexplored, especially in the instrumentation part, kind of unexplored and, in my opinion, promising area. Uh, some ideas that I came up with uh, automatic locking, um, you know, for maybe a container or so, classes. And 
then data access monitoring can instrument the code and see what is modified where. Then uh, execution tracing, uh, something like D-Trace, where you, know, you can run the tool to instrument your code with the trace points. Um, D-Trace is a really nice factor. But they, uh, the book, you, yeah. book just came out, by the way. Oh, in, really? In the last month. Okay. Uh, is it an O'Reilly book? No, 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 no. By the author, that, by one of the developers. Sorry. Sorry. Well, so another another example there would be, and, and I, I think various people have tried to come up with ways to do this in C++, with not 100% success, but like, you know, the classical precondition, postcondition, invariant checking you know where you know you get you somehow you're wrapping up a particular function designed by contract that's what designed by contract kind of stuff and you know you can do it direct in uh, ICO, but yeah you can you can instrument every every function in a class right. you know first call is a precondition check last call for every you know path that leads out of the function call yeah exactly last condition check you could actually do properties. Yeah. You know, with a private indicate you have a property and then it can inject code to, to handle it. Yeah. Well, in other um, areas, I have two, two items. Um, I don't know, some of you might be familiar with the GCC XML project. Um, basically, it dumps uh, a portion of GCC AST into X, in, in the XML format. Unfortunately, the well, two things are kind of unfortunate about the project. The first is that um, it, it's based on some older version of GCC and they quite actually a modified version of GCC. And the other one is it seems to be dead. But this idea can be pretty easily re-implemented as a GCC plugin. And the other um, uh, interesting area, at least to me, is, is, is what I call semantic graph. The um, basic idea of a semantic graph is to create a, a, fully con a fully connected representation of a C++ problem. For example, in, in GCC AST, if you have a, a, a class, you can find uh, its base class. But there's no easy way to find which other classes this base class is of. So in other wor words, the um, inheritance relationship can only be traversed in one direction. Uh, in contrast, in the semantic graph, uh, all relationships can be traversed in different in, in all directions. So, for example, you can get a type and, and find out all the variables in the translation unit that these variables of this type. Uh, this is actually something that we are already doing in ODB. Uh, instead of generating the database conversion code directly from from GCC AST, which, as you have seen, can be a bit inconvenient. Um, instead, we we first build a semantic graph and and then generate the code from that. Besides being more convenient to use and also uh, maintaining the declaration order, mm -hmm. uh, it also includes support for automatic traversal uh, along the relation the different ages. Um, more generally. Uh, when we try to reuse uh, a front end of an existing compiler, we want as much uh, information pre preserved in the AST as possible. Uh, unfortunately, this is uh, often in, at odds with the goals of people who want to use the compiler for its original purpose, which is to generate logic code. Um, this is actually, th this is probably felt to a greater extent in GCC and to a lesser extent in, in CLAN, because CLAN preserves more information, more lexical information. But um, the general conflict will always be there. Uh, if there's a choice between preserving some obscure bit of information in the AST and making the compiler just a little bit uh, faster, then you can be pretty sure that the latter will be will always be. Um, so building a semantic graph on demand from, from the AST representation can actually be a solution to this uh, dilemma. 
Um, let me wrap up then. Um, well, while it's um, often uh, easier and in fact preferable to write a C++ library than a code generator, some problems uh, can be solved easily and elegantly using a, a C++ parser. Up until recently that meant that we had to implement our own C++ parser or some ad hoc preprocessor. But now we, we, have a, um, we can reuse an existing compiler that is open source, cross-platform, uh, very widely deployed and, and very mature. Um, now if you want to, to learn more about, um, about parsing C++ with GCC plugins, I wrote a series of blog posts uh, that go in quite a bit more technical detail than this talk. Uh, they also contain links to, to the plugins that I mentioned uh, in, this, in this presentation. So this, you can find the source code there. The chapter 23 in the GCC internals documentation uh, uh, specifies the plugin interface. It's fairly thorough. Um, other chapters describe the GCC AST and and the macros that you can use to, to access uh, the data. Um, the, the document is sometimes outdated and sometimes inaccurate, but I think it's it's actually a fairly good starting point. There, there's also the GCC wiki plugin page, which lists existing plugins that were developed for GCC and also has pointers to other resources. Uh, the GCC source code itself is fairly well commented and I often use it as a source of definitive information. Finally, the GCC test suite contains a number of plugins uh, including examples of, of static analysis and uh, AST modification. Um, that's it from me. Thank you for your attention. Uh, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them.